morning. How are you doing today? I'm Jean Corollaire, the chair of the CODA Education Committee. I'm quite pleased to, to be, to welcome you this morning. <clears throat> we'll be talking about this, this uh, exceptional, between brackets, uh, Volkswagen Dieselgate case, uh, which raises a lot of questions, a lot of questions to board members across our geographies, particularly in Europe. Um, most of you will have attended one of the CODAS two days of uh, professional development training in the past. I hope you enjoyed it and you have good memory of that. In order to uh, maintain a sense of uh, European directors that you are, and also to allow CPD for some of you, ECODA is organizing a series of uh, webinars where we will analyze in depth specific case studies. And this is one of them. Maybe some of you have attended the previous one, uh, which was around uh, the BHS case in last November. Um, a number of questions around logistics. You know, logistics is key these days, but we have so many webinars. We are using Zoom, we are using Teams, we're using etc. So let's make sure that you are happy and comfortable with the tool we are using. Um, that will be, you'll be in silent mode. Oh, you know, in both some time, it's good to not to talk. Uh, but you are most than welcome to raise any questions across uh, the presentation. Be aware as well that the presentation will be recorded and will be available through the CODA YouTube channel later on. Now, coming to the point, I have the privilege to welcoming John Metzola. Um, John, the first thing I would like to say is that John is an alumnus from uh, Guberna, uh, the Belgium Institute, and congratulations, John, for having done that. Uh, in the past, he did a lot of things, 30 years, uh, global leadership uh, responsibilities at Dr. Gamble. He's now a professor of management practice at Solvay Business School that we like a lot, very good school, plus other active things that he's doing. Uh, moving to the contents, we'll be offer you the possibility to ask questions through the Q&A. You see, I don't know whether your screen you're having this in the top or the bottom. On my screen is on the bottom, Q&A. Please do use this uh, functionality to ask questions. But remember that you are board members and you should be putting yourself in board member shoe. This is really important. And express you, your views uh, with creativity, with dedication, uh, with courage, with a lot of things across the session. The session, by the way, uh, that will not be um, very long, but you'll see it very attractive. Uh, it will be organized in four parts, and um, John will be uh, walking you through that. Um, but I'm sure you'll be engaged and allow your dedication and ask questions. John, the floor is yours. Go ahead. Hey, thanks, uh, Jean. Um, and uh, nice to talk to you all, um, everybody. I'm not sure what you guys just saw all, but my computer just uh, shut down. <laughs> uh, just when Jean said uh, good morning. Um, so I hope that everybody can see what I'm now sharing. Um, That's good. That's good. Go ahead. Can you see? Okay, excellent. So let me, uh, let me tell you a bit about myself first. I will not talk too much about myself, but give a bit of background. Um, I used to work at P&G at the bottom, um, which is why I put it previously. Um, I retired five years ago. And um, initially I was thinking of spending the rest of my life at the beach, um, but that felt a bit boring. And so I, um, I, I've started my own company, which I call JNet Connect for lack of more creativity. Um, and, and it really is uh, about my passion for innovation. I've been leading innovation at P&G for 30 years. Um, and, uh, and, and, and the fascination for leadership in this space. I mean, how, how do leaders go and unleash an organization? Um, and, uh, and how do they sometimes get it really wrong? We're gonna show some of that in, in the session here, I guess, um, and learn from that. Um, and then I believe in connecting across dimensions, you know, connecting the consumer to the technology, connecting marketing to R&D, connecting the, all the functions, connecting the you know, Dutch, which I am, to Belgians. Um, and, uh, and, and just in general, unleashing the diversity of thought for better results uh, that leads to better innovation, um, which by the way, brings us back to the point of innovation. 
Um, as, uh, as John said, I joined uh, the Solar Brussels Schools as, as one of my outlets. Uh, I teach uh, my own course, Leading a Living Innovation, Advanced Masters, MBAs, uh, companies, uh, AB InBev, uh, Pfizer, you know, I go places, it's fun. And then uh, I also am serving the conference board, um, which is a New York based think tank, um, very well known in the US, not so much in Europe, where I lead their innovation and digital transformation institute, as they call it, uh, at Guberna. And then I'm not sure how it is in your country, but you need to go and do three parts of it. And one of this is uh, board effectiveness. And we have to write a thesis in Belgium for that. Um, and I, um, I, I have been, I'm fascinated about, you know, again, about leadership and how things can go wrong. And I, I, st I, I struck by a, by a colleague of mine at some Brussels school was working in this, on this case um, from an error management viewpoint. And I pulled information from him. And what I, what I found out when I did the research is that interestingly, a lot of the Volkswagen case is about what has gone on within the organization, mostly from a CEO perspective. What I found out is that actually um, the, bigger, the bigger story, I believe, is at the board level. Um, and so I'm going to go and, uh, and ladder that up uh, and take you uh, through uh, some of my, my learnings and insights from, from this case. I'm thrilled that at least I have now an outlet for um, sharing this thing uh, a, a bit more broadly because, of course, once you do this, it gets perfectly you know, classified and nobody ever hears of it anymore. So thank you for listening to my story. I'm all excited that uh, people want to listen to it. Before I go into it, please read this um, in, in you know, like one minute. I'm going to talk to people, no, sorry, I'm going to talk to people like you, but I'm going to talk about people as well, um, not with the intent to, uh, to badmouth anybody, but with the intent to learn from it definitely when it comes to leadership uh, mindset, behaviors, and, uh, and, and expression. Um, so, um, so please, this is all about learning, and this is not about badmouthing in any way, companies or individuals. Um, here's today's outline. Um, I'm going to set the stage a bit on the key players. Um, and then a big part is what dream did a significant player have um, and, uh, and, and what that led to. Um, uh, from there follow the plan, the results, the aftermath, and then of course the critical part is uh, what can we learn from those. And I've extracted four key lessons which I want to share with you at the end. Key players. Okay, here we go. We start with the key, with the key, with the key guy, um, the chairman. Uh, Ferdinand Piech, I'm not sure if anybody knows him, how many of you do know him or not. Um, he's a member of the Porsche family. Actually, he's the grandson of Ferdinand Porsche. And Ferdinand Porsche is, of course, the guy who uh, Hitler asked to go and introduce the people's car, um, and which is what Volkswagen really stands for, for those who are not versed in German. Um, and so, um, so this guy is, uh, is, is obviously has a, is a very elite background, um, very special individual. Um, pampered in his education, uh, in his upbringing, but also a good, a, a actually, you know, quite a smart guy. He was a top engineer. He has been credited by the invention of the Audi Quattro. Now, of course, you cannot, in my view, invent any significant, any any single person for anything. Was has always been a team effort. But you know, his name was against the Audi, Audi Quattro. So definitely, he was a top engineer. And by the way, he was a top engineer. Keep that in mind as we go forward and learn from what went on and what did engineers know and not know and what questions they asked and didn't ask. Um, he made it up to CEO of Audi, and from there he went to, uh, to go and move to the Volkswagen Group broader, and then in five years later he became uh, a CEO of Volkswagen as well. Um, and then, and this is significant, so he actually was CEO of Volkswagen for many years, uh, and then he moved up to chairman. So that's the background on, uh, on, on Fernand Pierre that you should know. And then the other thing you should know is he had a big ego. Um, and uh, he had, and he was very, very ambitious, and I call it, frankly, megalomaniac um, uh, ambition level. Um, uh, he had big dreams. Uh, he expanded the Volkswagen Group also hugely by a lot of acquisitions. Um, he also made several mistakes. Um, you know, he, uh, he wanted to buy um, uh, luxury brands. I think he wanted to buy Rolls Royce. He wanted to buy uh, um, uh, Bentley. In the end, he designed his own Phaeton, you know, luxury car, um, which uh, which really failed. Um, but uh, but he had he had a large ambition is the key point to make. And then the other thing you should know of him, he was a very aggressive, old style, I call that old style manager. Um, and he was he was even ruthless, and some people even call him cruel to a degree. Let me give you a few um, a few quotes just to illustrate that. Um, he said in his autobiography, "I would fire any assistant if they make the same mistake twice immediately." Um, so that's one. Um, uh, you know, another story. He had um, he had uh, uh, he was the the golf four. Um, he didn't like the the body fit of the, of the car. He called all his thirty two top engineers into his room, and he said, "Guys, you have six weeks to achieve world class body fit. If not, 
I will, re I will replace you all. Thank you for your attention today. Um, so that kind of uh, that kind of leadership, just to set uh, to set the tone. So very significant individual, and, and in my view, more of a key player than the one that has gotten most of the press, which is CEO Martin Winterkorn. In fact, Martin Winterkorn was a protege of um, of, of Ferdinand Pieck. Um, his career followed Pieck very very closely, um, and he became a disciple and a follower. You know, he was also working at Audi before. When, um, uh, uh, when Ferdinand Pieck was CEO, uh, when he became CEO of Audi, um, he, he worked for, uh, you know, Pieck. When, when Pieck left, he took over the CEO role of Audi. Um, and eventually also became, um, he, he got, uh, Pieck got uh, Martin Winterkorn to become the CEO of, uh, of uh, Volkswagen. And, and that long-standing close relationship is actually a very interesting feat you should take in. Um, because, of course, it's very attractive, right? Um, See chairman and CEO that have worked for so long together, they had a very good personal relationship, and that's awesome for that facilitates decision making, right? So, is that a model for the future? Maybe or maybe not. We're going to go and look at that a bit later. Um, the other thing you should know about Volkswagen this was Volkswagen's leadership team. Now, need I say more? What strikes you in this? Um, I will not make any further comment, I'll let you draw your own conclusions. Um, and. Uh, and then I want to go and talk a bit about the board makeup. Um, interesting, um, uh, you should know that the Porsche and Pierre families were dominant um, behind their dual and multi-class uh, share strategy. They had uh, 30, what is the number? 31.5% of the equity, I think it was. Um, yeah, 31% or 31.5% of the equity, but because of the smart um, uh, share structure, they owned 50.7% um, uh, of the voting rights which gave them five seats out of the 10 that they had. And of course they could choose the chairman. Um, and of course that was, you know, Pieck. Um, so, uh, so that's a thing to take in. Um, the total board uh, uh, related to the, to the meter steaming gazettes in uh, Germany was, you know, 20 people, of which half was, were part of the, was, were the you know, workforce. And then there was also a prominent government uh, or state presence, the lower Saxony um, uh, region held, um, 12.4% uh, of equity um, and a bit more, I think, of the vote, no, a bit less of the voting rights. Um, so, um, and of course, uh, you know, keep that in mind as well. The state presence is always a bit difficult where political and economic um, uh, um, uh, considerations uh, are not always necessarily um, looking at the right, at the same direction. That's the board makeup. Then let's look at, uh, at how things unfolded. And it started with, an, uh, with the ambition that Ferdinand Pieck had. Um, not with the Corn Pieck. Um, he had a dream. Uh, he had a, a, a big, the BHAG, for those of you who are not familiar with the term, is the big, the big, hairy, audacious goal. And that's a good management principle, right? Um, but it needs to be, there needs to be some kind of realism in there. And that's why I call it, uh, he had a BHAG on steroids. Um, he was absolutely convinced that he wanted to make Volkswagen the largest car maker in, in, in the world. That was the extreme as soon as he became chairman of the board, and maybe even earlier. Um, and, uh, and in order for him, in order to achieve that, you know, when you look at the, the results, Volkswagen was very strong in, uh, in, the large, in the large European market, but they were very weak in the, in the, uh, the other significant market, the other huge market at the time, and that was the U.S., um, he needed to go and, um, and, and, and build a business in the U.S. by a factor of 3x. And that was not easy because Volkswagen had a tainted history in the U.S. They had a short spell of success when, uh, remember the Beetle with the hippies um, and then a the Volkswagen bus, which still comes through in some of the older movies. Um, and, uh, but then that, uh, that hype tainted, that hype uh, got lost. Um, they actually got a very poor reputation. The Japanese came in in those years and they obviously had made very good cars. Volkswagen didn't follow. Um, so the reputation became very poor. And on top of that, they were looking at a declining trend. So, wow, um, that was a big challenge, right? And then on top of all of those business challenges, there was also a challenge that they needed to break through diesels, um, NOx, you know, some people call it NOx. This is a nitrogen oxide um, of different ox you know, uh, oxygen uh, molecule uh, numbers. <laughs> And so it can be NO, NO0, it can be NO, NO2, NO3. Um, and, uh, and, and so what you should know is that um, uh, diesels, diesel cars um, are uh, very good for CO2 exhausts, but they are not very good for NOx exhausts. The European regulations follow the Kyoto Protocol and they, uh, they measure um, CO2 exhausts. 
which is why diesels are so incredibly popular in, uh, in, in, uh, in, in Europe. As a consequence, however, they have very high NOx um, you know, exhaust. It's either one or the other. And that's very significant when it comes to the challenge, uh, as, as we're going to see later. The US regulations by the EPA are all based on NOx, not on CO2, or at least not as much. Uh, and so, um, so okay, Volkswagen's prowess is in, in diesel engines. How do they go? Are they going to go and, and design a, a petrol engine, um, a gasoline engine, which would be good for NOx? No, that's not what they were going to do. They were going to go and crack um, the diesel challenge, the diesel NOx challenge. That's what they set themselves to. And of course, they're an engineering company, so they have um, they have a maybe a possible right to succeed in this what some people call uh, impossible. Um, uh, challenge of two forces that, that need to come together. Anyway, the engineers went to work. They kicked off the clean diesel project in 2006. Um, and, uh, and of course, the management knew it was an impossible challenge. But remember the, the management style. We do not take no for an answer. You know, we only want to hear good news. Um, and so whenever somebody came with it, they, they said, hey, you're going to fix it. We are Volkswagen. And you know what? In 2008, there was the eureka moment. They came back and, and they had this. Uh, this moment where um, uh, they came up with what they call very uh, aspirationally the EA189 Gen 1 Miracle Engine with Lean NOx Trap or LNT um, to give it more um, uh, scientific uh, um, sex, I guess, um, sex appeal, I should say. So, wow, this was amazing, right? The miracle car, the impossible puzzle was, was solved and, uh, and it got to the US green car of the year. Um, initially with the Jetta, as you can see here, but then they obviously um, uh, expanded it also on the other, um, on the other line of the, of the car. Um, and yes, in 2014, which was six years, let me see, eight years after they set the challenge, eight, um, in 2006, in 2008, they got the, they got the Eureka moment, and of course they needed to build a business. And, but by, by 2014, um, Piech achieved uh, his dream of becoming the largest car manufacturer in the world, beating Toyota, which by the way, at the time had some problems, remember those? Um, they had some issues with their, um, they had a huge recall um, with their uh, hybrid uh, engine at the time. I think it was related to that, I, 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 I don't remember. So, um, the results, um, you know, I showed some of the results already from, a, from an execution level, but of course, I mean, my God, these guys were, were you know, were, they were floating to, to the moon. The Piek Winterkorn Scopo Star was shining brightly. It was being seen as a role model of leadership, um, chair level and, 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 and CEO. You see how that combination works and how the management style of don't take no for an answer. You know, it really, really works if you set your mind to it and if you have the right people in the organization. You know, share price quintupled in those years. Um, it got so bad um, or so, <laughs> so significant, so interesting that uh, PX former nanny, who was now his wife, um, he actually got her on the board. And Winterkorn's conversation, which was uh, based on the, on the US principles of, um, you know, related to share price you know, appreciation, skyrocketed as well. He's one of the best paid, paid managers in Europe, if not the best paid you know, manager in Europe. So everything looked great, okay. Um, John, prior to moving to the bubble bust, yeah, hang on, I'm going there now. This is yeah, the last I'm slide, speaking. John. Yeah. Um, and so, but so when something looks uh, and smells too good to be true, there is a fair chance that it is. Um, and uh, did they ask themselves the question? I don't know. Should they have asked? Should they have asked themselves the question? Remember, both of them. I forgot to mention the Wintercore. Both of them were um, celebrated, renowned, experienced um, engineers. And I'm not sure if there's engineers, any engineers in the audience, but uh, an engineer will never take, or like, yeah, you fixed it, and not ask the question, well, how did you do it? So when it comes to the question that we're going to talk later on, um, did they know? Did they not know? Um, I, I'm going to not give any answer, um, but I have my own thoughts on that. Jean, let me stop yeah. here because I've talked a lot um, and uh, see if no, there's no, any, no, any no, thoughts no, and no, questions no. Uh, related to what I just said. That's great. Um, maybe if you could uh, be closer to the microphone, maybe it would be okay. louder. Okay, thank you. Um, I, I'm seeing here a few questions around the makeup of the board. This is not surprising. And particularly around um, where was uh, gender diversity at large. Uh, where are the stakeholders in this dream? Um, 
And uh, finally, what is the, let, let, let's, let's take the, this first, first question. Diversity and stakeholders, where are they in this stream? Well, the stakeholders I already mentioned. I mean, they are the, mo this is the most significant. I mean, there's actually um, uh, uh, three key stakeholders. Um, the um, uh, the Piech and the Porsche families, um, who, as I said, owned 31.5, but it was actually a very smart deal because by getting only 31, by, by investing 31.5% of the equity, they got through the voting rights uh, principles in, in uh, Germany, they got 50.7% uh, of the voting rights. So that's the most significant thing that you need to know. Um, the Qatar, um, there was a Qatar investment company that, um, that also was at 15.4% of, uh, of the equity. Um, but they, they sort of, I mean, they didn't know really what they were doing in terms of uh, understanding the, the business very well. And they relied hugely on Piek. Piek was such a dominant character, so much experience in the field, you know, so much experience in the industry, you know, and, and things went all well. So everybody trusted him to go, and we're going to look at that a bit more uh, later on when we do an analysis. But people just, I mean, they relied on Piek to set, to set the agenda, to set the direction, and to execute it with this, um, with this uh, puppet uh, winter core. So that's one thing. And then the other part, you mentioned diversity, absolutely. I mean, again, that's why I showed the picture, you know, just to illustrate that. But there was no diversity on the board. Um, and, uh, and, 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 you know, again, we're gonna look at the analysis in one of the four lessons is you need to have the diversity of thinking going in there. So you have the right conversations happening. They never happened. Okay, John, I I'm seeing an another question, which is really interesting. Um, John, would you think uh, someone in the board could or should have raised his hand and say stop? And particularly when you are, but remember, you need to be skeptical about miracles. Yeah, absolutely. But again, everybody relied too much on Pierre. <laughs> and so when you look back, I mean, that's exactly what board members should be doing, right? Asking the question. Um, but when you look at the uh, dynamics of the board, um, it, it, it wasn't an open one of questions. Um, we're going to look at the role of the chairman as one of the insights later on. And the, and the role of the chairman is to facilitate, right? To open up. And guys, any questions? Let's go and challenge this, this point of view. Do you really think Piet did that in these sessions? Uh -uh, I don't think so. That was not his style. That was not the way that he was running the business. It was not the way that he was running the board, I should say. And from there, the business. Okay. We're going to talk, we're going to talk more in, in detail Absolutely. when we come to the analysis. Let's go ahead right? with the bubble bust. Yeah, okay, good. So, thank you for the questions, guys, by the way. Um, and we're going to go and talk that a bit later on. So, the aftermath, the bubble burst. Um, there was an environmental NGO that did some work um, through the, the Virginia, the, the State University of Virginia. And uh, you know what they found? Uh, they found that emission levels, um, when they drove the car around, were actually 40 times, up to 40 times what they was claimed. What was claimed. So, they go, how did this work? They started to analyze it. And they found uh, huge differences between the emissions that were uh, measured when in the test situation, in the official EPA test conditions, versus what happened on the road. And, um, and, and so, how did it happen? And, and, but it was the reality. So, EPA noticed, uh, issued this notice of violation of the Clean Air, you know, Care Act. Um, of the Clean Air Act, I should say. Um, and, uh, and, of course, then they go and, and did the, 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 uh, the analysis. And they found this defeat device software. And what did the, the, the defeat device software do? It measured um, when the car, it could detect when the car was in test conditions. And it was really because in test conditions, only two of the wheels turned um, versus when it was on the road when four, when four uh, uh, wheels turned, right? So as soon as the device um, picked up that only two wheels turned, the engine power dropped. The, 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 the software um, forced the engine power to go and drop. And obviously, with the engine power to drop, um, the, uh, the exhaust drops significantly, uh, you know, as well. Um, and uh, and so, uh, so that was the way that, um, that was the miracle <laughs> that Volkswagen uh, uh, got out of, that uh, made Volkswagen get out of this uh, devil's dilemma that they had to, uh, technically. So when you then get it back to the managers, um, and it's also interesting, then Piek went public and say, I'm distancing myself from Wintercorn when this thing finally uh, burst into the press, into the open. Um, and interestingly, um, I, I think I told you how the power of Piek and our puppet and our Wintercorn was more as puppet than anything else. 
interestingly, by that time, there was a, the, 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 the world started to, the ball started to fall on a different camp. And, um, and the one to resign was, was Piek. He also was a bit old. I think he was 78 years by the time. Maybe he lost a bit of energy. I don't know. Um, but, uh, but Winterkorn stayed on. Uh, and Piek said, I'm out of here. Um, and, uh, and he started to focus on, um, on other things, including the finances of his own uh, Porsche and, uh, and Piek empire. Winterkorn had to resign eventually as well because the position became untenable. Um, but he admitted no wrongdoing on his part, and and he still play, he still blamed it was done by renegade engineer renegade engineers, and he had in absolutely no uh, knowledge of anything going wrong. Um, he went on a video initially to save himself, but it was a very poor performance. Nobody believed him anymore, and the guy on the right uh, was the new CEO. I forgot his name for a second, um, and he took over. Um, and of course, with that comes a huge loss of, uh, of market value, right? 40% of uh, Volkswagen's market value got lost, 25 billion in market cap, and, um, and, uh, and they got back to, to where they started, um, uh, and even worse. So I want to move into the analysis next, but before yeah, that, any specific questions on this, Sean? Yeah, one question I would like, there are, there are many questions about the, the makeup of the board, independent directors, stakeholders, etc. Um, but uh, f first of all, I would say I'm taking just one now. Uh, what about the regulators? In, in Germany, for instance, they're having regulators. Haven't done their job? Well, um, you know, everybody believed Volkswagen was too big to fail. Um, 600,000 people um, working at Volkswagen. Um, and, uh, and, and of course, that 600,000 people is a lot of jobs, right? And this is where um, the, um, the government through the lower Saxony region comes in and the, and the, the whole, the whole uh, uh, what's the word, friction between um, uh, economic interests um, as well as political interests. So um, there was a, uh, they had so, such a cloud that, you know, the Europeans also got wind of this thing, but Volkswagen was convinced that they were, they were able with their uh, lobbying to go in and keep the, um, uh, the European uh, checkers into check. <laughs> Um, and uh, and to, to some degree, they actually succeeded. They actually, they actually uh, su succeeded. In the U.S., they had less clouds. They tried. Um, they tried to, for a long time to go and um, and put pressure on this uh, this small NGO. Um, they 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 uh, they put out threats. Um, but in the end, the guys persisted. They got the, the ear of the EPA, and of course, when the EPA comes in, then then the thing starts to turn the other way, right? Um, then the pendulum swings to, uh, oh my gosh, um, this is serious. Um, and they got fined, as you know, big time, as I told you, big time. Um, so, um, so, so yes, uh, Jean, that was indeed at play, um, but, um, but they were, um, uh, their cloud in Europe was such, and the importance for jobs was such that, um, that they blew up in the US more than in Europe. What I would suggest, Jean, is you, you, get, you get across the learning uh, since I'm seeing a lot of questions, but uh, we, we'll take them just after that. Okay. Hope Please I can start. answer some of them. Um, let me, um, I love learning. I mean, I, I talk a lot about um, in my course on uh, how important it is to create what I call a learning culture or a love of learning culture. Um, and I always try to live my own learning principles. Um, and so what can, what have I learned from this? Um, I wanted to share with you and you may pull your own learnings. Um, I, I, I looked. Uh, I look back at the role of the board in this um, in my thesis, um, and, and in my megalomaniac dream is the conclusion that I'm drawing from this. Um, that's one. The role of the board wasn't adhered to. Number two, board dynamics. Um, you asked some questions around that. Um, there was no balance. There was no team. The diversity of thought wasn't there. Not even because of the people that were in there necessarily, as you saw the picture before. Um, but also, you just, I mean, the, 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 it was almost like, I can't, I, I never, I have not attended a board meeting, it was almost like, you know, the, the, the diversity of the board that was there, you know, the Qatar folks, the Lower Saxony, the, the, uh, the worker, the, the union representation, you know, it was in PX interest to go and make it dysfunctional so that he could drive his own agenda, he could drive his own, you know, big, hairy, audacious goal. Um, so there wasn't, any, I can imagine that there really wasn't in any way to go and have a, let's have a conversation about the three principles that the board should be, should be adhering to. It was all in service of that, of that, uh, of that goal. 
Um, so what you end up with is, is Peter Senge is one of my favorite thinkers, right? How can a board of committed members with individual IQs of 120 can have a collective IQ of 60 instead of 180? Um, you know, that's, that really was at play here. Um, and, uh, and it's a great lesson for guys. Be careful on, on, on how you go and manage your board and step back sometimes. They call it, uh, what I learned in my previous life is, you know, you need to be as a leader uh, or as a member of the board, you know, try to be on the stage, but also at the balcony. So sometimes step back or like, wait, what dynamics are at play here? You know, is everybody being heard? Is everybody actually contributing? Um, and of course, that's the role of the chairman, first and foremost, in my opinion. Um, but you can all play a role. We can all play a role in this. Um, comes to the role of the chairman, number three, um, should be, I'll mention this, I, I, I got to this point already several times, a primus inter pares, right? A facilitator, a coach should have skills like listening, empathy, emotional sensitivity, and agility. Now, does that sound like Piek? Um, I don't think so. This one doesn't pop. I don't know why. The reality is it wasn't, it wasn't PIEC at all, right? Um, and, uh, and so the lesson is you need to watch out for these, you know, we tend to, as humans, we sometimes look at these strong leaders that seem to be having the answers. We have one in the US sitting now as well. Um, you know, you know what I'm talking about. Um, and, uh, and they are charismatic and they have a loud voice and they have a, a strong personality and they have a lot of, a lot of credentials. Um, and we go, oh yeah, they probably think that what they, they probably know what they're talking about. Um, and with that comes a strong, you know, ego. Um, and on top of that, you have those disclosures with the CEO, which is a beautiful line of one between the board, the board, uh, and, and the executive committee. Um, and, and so, guys, we're on top of the world. And then when you see the results coming in, instead of leaning back and celebrating well, like, Hey, this is all great. Ask the questions. You know, this is, I always talk about the Nokia case in my, in my, um, you know, my classes as well. Right. I mean, when Nokia, when Nokia was on a high, they should have stepped back or like, okay, what can happen? What can happen to us? And what should, how should we reinvent ourselves for the future? And then, and then Apple comes in and they were totally blindsided. Um, and, 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 you know, this, 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 this live differently in the Volkswagen case, it's got to expect differently in the Volkswagen case, but it also led to, uh, to the disaster that they found themselves into. And then my fourth point, and it's, uh, it's a, again, I already mentioned, I love, uh, you know, this whole, the whole notion of learning culture. Um, and you need to be, you need to understand what culture is in the organization. You know, there was a culture of fear at Volkswagen through that leadership style that was so autocratic and dominant. Um, you know, people didn't, it was, it was only, we will not take no for an answer. So nobody spoke up. Um, and, uh, and it's actually interesting. I'll need to show you something here. Uh, where is it here? I'm not sure if anybody knows Amy Edmondson. Um, I, I, she's written, she's a thinker from Harvard, a professor. Um, in my work on culture, I did for p and I was inspired by her work earlier on. She just written this outstanding new book, which is called The Fearless Organization. It's, it's, it's red hot um, when you go into the business world. Um, and then I would all urge you to go and read that. She is the mother of the notion of psychological safety. You know, leaders need to uh, create a, a, a culture of psychological safety where people feel safe to express themselves, come up with crazy ideas and have a difficult conversation about things, ask challenging questions. Um, and they will only do that when you, when they feel safe. Um, and if not, you get, uh, you get this culture of fear and you need to go and get to the speak of culture. And of course, you know, the tone is set from the top, right? It's, it's set from the top. It needs to start all the way at the board level. That behavior needs to be lived in boards um, and, uh, and, and from there in the executive committee and from there deep down into the organization. Um, and, and of course, you know, values and living, those, declaring the values and living those values um, through your behaviors is absolutely critical as board members. Um, and, uh, and integrity is, is, I always tell my students, you know, you can pick whatever values work for you, but the one value that you should not compromise on is integrity. Um, and you know what, when you look at this story and so many other things that have gone wrong, I, I'm fascinated about that. You know, my, next, my, next, my next case is going to be Boeing. Um, and of course, WorldCom before that, Enron before that, Blockbuster before that. I mean, there's so many lessons you can pull from, from this. Um, and, and many of them have gone wrong because integrity was lost. And that needs to be owned, um, uh, particularly at the board level. And so um, Linda Hill is, a, is an Harvard professor, and she's also an authority in, uh, in, in, uh, in leadership. And she says the primary responsibility of, of 
today's leader is to create an environment where leaders want to belong. I call this generative leadership. You need to go and, and make sure that you lift people up, speak up culture, everybody engaged and contributing. Um, and by the way, this crisis drives that even harder than before. So in summary, um, maybe Jean, I can show you uh, my, uh, my, my, my extract and then we have the discussion. Um, in summary, you know, be careful. Autocratic Machiavellian board leadership um, uh, and, and, and having a, a direct line with the CEO, um, and watch out, uh, sign of danger. If that gets added, if that gets uh, topped up with, uh, with very ambitious goals that are totally unrealistic, um, uh, then, uh, then, then be even more careful. And then when you have a culture of where everybody just follows um, and you have people bringing their body to work but not their critical mind, um, that leads you to danger. And then if you flip that, um, you look at opportunity. So, you know, when it comes back to what I think the board should be, it should be a government centric board with balanced leadership. Um, and, uh, and, and that balanced leadership obviously needs to be um, uh, set, that needs to be uh, led by the you know, chairman. And you need a diverse and inclusive board, um, sorry, the diverse board and then inclusive board dynamics. You know, DNI, which some companies call it, talks to the city, so is about diversity and inclusion. You need diversity of thinking, but you need to work really hard to include the diversity of thinking, otherwise, it just separates. Um, and the board needs to set the tone in that for the rest of the organization so that you create the right culture. Um, and I call that the speak up learning culture. So that's my, um, that's my story and I'm sticking to it. No, no, I want to hear um, feedback and, um, and, and additional uh, learnings um, in this space. Great. Thank you. Um, so let me keep this slide up as a, uh, as a basis for our conversation. Absolutely. Thank you. Thank you, Edith. Thank you again. Uh, first of all, I would like to congratulate our board members today. They are really good. And I'm seeing the questions that are really tough and, uh, and, and very helpful. Thank you. And uh, inspiring. <clears throat> Let, let's start by, by, by this one. Uh, around the uh, two tier and uh, the question, uh, I, I read it here. Since the German two tier board model is weaker than the UK style single board model, uh, how did both boards fail? Should, shouldn't the two-tier model have prevented this from happening? And particularly, I would like to add another question, which is related to this one. Uh, you, you, in Germany, we are having uh, the unions on the board. Uh, we are having employees. Um, and uh, one of our participants says, neither worker representative of the other Saxony state ask any question, was due, whether due to incompetence of willful blindness. So question around the, the model. And the second one is about um, workers and, um, and stakeholders, I would say. Yeah, I, I really, I'm not an expert in this whole uh, tiers, uh, you know, structure. So I'm, I apologize. And maybe I should have caveated that earlier on. You know, I, I again, I graduated in Guberna, Belgium. Um, I, uh, I, I've, been, I've been interested by this whole tiering thing about Germany, and I'll display it out here. I cannot really judge. Um, I would, however, argue, and that gets us to the second uh, question, that for me, I think it can all work. You know, it can all work, with maybe the exception of the government involvement, right? I think, I think the worker involvement can all work if you approach it, in, you know, in the, in the right way. Um, but you need to make sure that you drive that, and I think you said it, is it willful incompetence or whatever you call it? Um, I, I, you know, yes, I mean, it needs to be from, almost like in management and leadership, or leadership and the organization, you know, same thing, right? It needs to come from two angles. But I always say the first priority lies at the leadership. Um, and then, of course, the people need to also step up and step forward in the organization. I think the same is in boards. You know, the chairman's role is hugely important, but of course, everybody needs to take their responsibility. Um, and, uh, and otherwise you shouldn't be on the board uh, because you, you can compensate it for it as well. Um, so um, so I, I think, you know, again, things, um, the bigger part is, is guys, I mean, you know, roll the chairman and understand yourself what dynamics are at play. You know, is there space on the one hand for um, diversity of thinking leading to, you know, the right questions, um, leading to uh, the best answers um, or, um, or is there not? Um, is there a culture of fear and, uh, and, and, and unbalance and, and in this case, dominance of the, of, of the, of the chair? All right, thank you. A another one which is really interesting for me, um, when, when I'm sitting as a board member, 
independent of this um, Volkswagen case. When there is such a highly technical between brackets detail, how can I, as a board member, take a look at that and uh, analyze it and, and, uh, and be comfortable with that? Well, should, should, I, should, me, should, should I have seen this problem? Well, I think, I think uh, maybe a few thoughts from my side. I mean, it's up to everybody to go and decide from themselves. First of all, I think you should only join boards where you think you can contribute something. So if, if you are like, have an aversion to technology, um, don't join the Google board. Um, uh, you know, that could be not maybe your passion. But then once you make that step, you know, go and, and, uh, and, and get yourself uh, prepared. Understand what goes on, you know. So show interest. Um, it's all about curiosity. Uh, that's back, by the way, to a lot of learning culture. It says start from curiosity. And as a board level, again, you need to lead that, I think, by example. Uh, and, and then within, and then as a third level on that is make, to me, it is not, you don't need to know to have the answers, right? But don't necessarily trust others to have the answer either. Your job is to ask critical questions. Go like, okay, but why? You know, it's the why, why, why principle. Um, and, uh, and, and so, so that's the way that I would be thinking about it. Um, and back to this case, absolutely. I don't think the board did its job, you know, in any, in any, uh, in any way. Okay. Thank you. A lot of questions around independent directors. Um, where are there any independent directors in principle in the board? Independent directors. Um, that means from the Porsche, from, uh, from the Saxony, and, and from the unions. I, I, I guess so. I mean, they were, they were, what do you mean with independent in this, in this case? Uh, let me, uh, I mean, someone appointed uh, irrespective of uh, his, his uh, direct stakeholder, for instance. Well, yeah, I mean, they were, they, because they were from, I think the Quattara Oil Company in principle, I think the board all, the board looked for good from in principle, you know, except for the political one, maybe. Um, but what we're seeing here is really because of the way that it was managed is they were operating as an insider's board. Fascinating, you know, fascinating on, 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 the, on the power that, um, uh, that the, the power play by, by Pierre was masterful. Um, when you think of it, at him from a from his sole interest, um, and uh, and so uh, so yeah, you need in, independent directors, and I think they had sufficient in principle in the, in, the, in the independent directors. But the dynamics at play, led by the chair um, and the attitudes by the board members, um, they were um, they fell short. All right. Uh, another question, just to, to uh, anybody else has an answer. By the way, you may also pick some answers from the audience because I, you know, I don't have all the answers. <laughs> no, okay. That, yeah, uh, the uh, you, you know that there has been this uh, this case, and uh, last year we had the the Renault case with another strong leader who was who is uh, Carlos Ghosn. We have not done the same exercise for Renault for the time being, but uh, would you have any clue? as to why in this kind of organization, one strong leader can influence for a, lo for a long time and then there is really a real failure. Well, it happens all the time. It happens all the time. We get, we get enticed by strong leaders. You know, we get, uh, we get misled by strong leaders, you know, particularly in this world, right? We're living, I always tell my, I call this a VUCA world. I'm not sure you guys know this term, volatile, uncertain, complex and ambiguous. And I, that, I, always, I always start my speeches and my, my lectures with, you know, we're living in the VUCA world, um, uh, which, uh, which, by the way, that was before the Corona crisis. So now we're living in a VUCA world on steroids. Uh, and, um, uh, and it, it, you know, in this world, it's so complex um, that leaders don't have the answers. Um, and uh, and uh, that's why I, 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 it's absolutely critical that, um, that, that, that leadership um, flips becomes generative and taps into the resources at hand. Um, and then when you think about leader of an organization, of course, that's the people that are you know, within the organization. Um, but the board also needs to think about what resources do I have to go and learn uh, from, from others so that I can go and, and we can go jointly to make, to make the best decisions. Uh, the world is too complex for one person to really know where to go. Um, and so you need to be able to, to have the appropriate humility, the appropriate vulnerability, surround yourself with people that actually, um, you know, have diverse thoughts that help you make the best decisions. 
um, and uh, and many of these leaders they're not. I mean Enron, you know, I'm not sure anybody hears the Enron uh, case. Well, yeah. These guys were um, uh, were ruthless as well. I mean, they, they, it was they were very very smart, um, and uh, and they made a fool out of everybody who was not as smart as they. Um, and and so that really lived in space there. Um, and when you analyze um, uh, the demise of many companies, you find that often it is this this uh, this megalomaniac uh, CEO, um, which in this case it uh, it led it up the board, board chairman. Who, um, who, uh, who sets the tone and what he goes and believes the person. And, uh, and, and in the end, and, and by the way, early results may often get in, which is the, which that's the whole thing, right? That they, again, Volkswagen, they were on, remember this, the, 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 the middle part of the presentation? They were on, they were on the moon. Um, but then, you know, the questions were not asked. The why, why, why wasn't done. The, the leaning, instead of leaning back and, and celebrating the, the results, guys, let's reinvent ourselves now before it's too late. Um, so, uh, so yeah, many of those stories, um, they have, uh, have been, uh, the, the tone is set from the top. What, what you're saying, this kind of, um, of, I would say, failure or strong ego, et cetera, uh, are also happening in small and medium-sized companies. So most of our people today are, uh, board members in small and medium-sized companies. Yeah, what I, I, your well, recommendation to them? No, I think it's a principal point, which, in, to my, in my humble opinion, travels uh, travels. Uh, you know, again, it's at board level, it's in organizational level, it's at large companies, it's at small companies. The principal travels. Um, I mean, if I if I think about it for a second, um, it actually may be particularly um, important for small family-owned businesses where you have a, a strong, you know, uh, patriarch leader who has maybe even set up the company and it goes like, guys, I know exactly what to do. And, the, and everybody keeps on following the patriarch, right? Um, except the world changes. And so then the next generation, well, maybe we should do this differently. Maybe we should go and, and put an Instagram account and making this up to dramatize, right? Or maybe we should go and get online and sell online. And the, no, 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 I don't want to. Bet. I mean, you know, these things can 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 happen there, uh, maybe even more often than um, than uh, at you know, public companies like 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 uh, you know Volkswagen. So, so I think it's a matter of to all of us when you are at the supervisory board of such a company, you know, watch out for for these uh, for these strong drives uh, based on uh, on historic success, um, and uh, and of course check the chairman, you know, as well as chairman, you know, lead as I said with humility and inclusion. Um, and, uh, and and if if you don't see the chairman operating this way, you know, try to gently push back and uh, and uh, and play play a, a role of, uh, of sometimes a devil's advocate. Um, that has to be the role of the company. In the end, it is about is about governance and it's about uh, protecting the institution. I have an, another interesting question about uh, any lessons learned from this story regarding German re uh, governance regulations. Uh, particularly around uh, diversity, around uh, independent directors, etc. Have you got any clue about what happened? No, I don't. I haven't really followed up on the German um, specifics per se, as I, as I said. Also, not in this, you know, this light. I do know. I mean, I, I consult with German companies, um, and I, I talk a lot in, in Frankfurt, uh, in particular. Um, and uh, yeah, diversity in Germany continues to be a challenge. I'm not sure where they are lately. You know, lately. Um, but uh, but boy, I mean, you know, you need diversity of thought in, in your in your board. And by the way, that's not only about gender, right? That's also about different education levels, um, different personality profiles, different uh, different nationalities, um, uh, and so it's all about diversity of thinking. But then you need to work, as I said before, you need to work hard to include the, your diversity. Diversity alone is not enough. Actually, I'm uh, tomorrow. If anybody is interested in inclusion. Um, let me know. Send me a mail or through Ekada. I Tomorrow I am uh, I'm doing a tomorrow Friday. Yeah, I I'm, I've set up a separate a company. It's not a company. It's a network um, which I call Includers, um, and we have an authority. I'm moderating an authority on uh, on inclusion. Um, who works at the UN, uh, joining us uh, for an hour, uh, you know, uh, conversation with. Um, so I, I have a huge passion for um, what I call inclus in inclusion as part of leadership, or some people call it inclusive leadership. Um, and again, that is not only in companies, that needs to ladder up to the board, and frankly, the board needs to set the example. Uh, another interesting thing that is uh, <clears throat> really um, 
passionate in some countries like, like France, for instance. Uh, we're having our PDGs. Uh, uh, the question is really spot on, I would say. Is this a good example of why the CEO should not become the next chairman? Yeah, well, it's a watch out, indeed. That's what I learned, by the way. I never really internalized this. And by the way, as you know, in many US companies, it's where the CEO, I mean, I take P&G, the CEO is the chairman of the board, right? Um, and so I have never thought of this while I was working at P&G until I, I, I analyzed this case. But like, guys, I mean, is that, is that right? <laughs> Um, and again, if, you're, if your CEO has got the, the heart in the right place and lives some of the principles that I'm looking at now, that we're looking at now in this slide, then I think it can work. But uh, it can also be a watch out. Watch out for strong men. Yeah, watch out, yeah. Uh, another thing, um, which is, uh, I read it since I found it very interesting. Uh, the core problem is how do you find the right people with the right and complementary hard and soft skills to sit on the board? Yeah, we talk about soft skills, which is really key. For yeah. it. But aren't we still in an old boys club or network? And how can we change this? How can we influence this? Yeah, we, uh, yes, we are in an old boys uh, uh, network. Um, we, um, and by the way, that's one of the things which we're gonna uh, uh, attack at this includers network. Um, because you need to break through the institutionalized behaviors, the institutionalized thing that happened. You know, this is what we're finding out is that these things like bias trainings and stuff like that, right? They don't really make any difference. Companies have concluded they've done bias training over the last 10 years and, and nothing changes. Um, they still don't get the women in leadership that they need to um, or in boards. And, um, and so you need to really understand what goes on at the, at the institutional level. Um, there's some excellent articles in HBR recently on uh, what hold, what's, what actually in the, in the last uh, version of HBR, what really holds women back? And, uh, and you know what, it is not about uh, uh, bias trainings from men, by men or women or both, um, but it's really about, uh, about institutional behaviors um, that, are, that, that are so in, ingrained in the way that we think and act that you need to force things through. That's why the 30% rule or whatever it is, 30, one third or 30% rule in Belgium, I think, uh, I think this is, yeah, I think people may not like rules. Well, we need an intervention. We need an intervention to go and break through the ingrained way of thinking, the ingrained reality that we all live and sometimes don't even know that we live. Oftentimes don't even know that we live. So yeah, we need to break, we all need to go and step back from what's going on and, and why, do, why are things the way they are and, and what do we need to change? John, I'm taking a, a last question for today and I'll be back after that. Would a different voting structure that did not create a built-in majority have helped. For instance, if the, board, the, the Porsche family would not have had the, between brackets the majority of the board. Well, that's an excellent question and I really cannot answer that. Um, and my gut, to be honest, is that it may not have. Piek was such an icon, was so dominant, was such a, uh, an example and, uh, and he just, I mean, again, look at his track record, right? I mean, you know, chairman of uh, the family, the education, the excellent engineer, the Audi experience, the Quattro, the CEO, CEO of Volkswagen, the, the president, um, uh, or the chairman, I should say, of, uh, of, of the board. Holy cow, I mean, everybody looked up at this guy. And, and, and so I think we would all be probably going like, man, he knows what he's talking about. Um, and, and, and that's where things get scary. <laughs> yeah, that's, uh, so, I mean, Gossam, right? I mean, you mentioned, uh, I don't know, I remember five or maybe even 10 years, I used to live in Japan for several years. He was already there um, and then, and he was an icon as well. Everybody thought he was eternally, we're going around, my God. And then, and then look what happens next. Okay, um, thank you very much. Um, I'm seeing a lot of questions and also a lot of, I would say, um, viewpoint will be interesting. I think what we'll do, Beatrice and John, um, if you agree, we'll be trying and summarize some of these um, viewpoints and circulate that to our group so that everyone gets uh, some, someone, something uh, tangible from, uh, from this webinar. Uh, John, I, I, one, one last word from you. What would be your three keywords for our board members to take away home? Um, 
it needs to be it needs to be governance uh, ethics based governance. That's one. Yeah, we did know uh, it. It's good ethics based governance. That's one. Number two, it needs to be inclusive. Um, and so diverse, diverse, an inclusive board. Um, and number three would be create that speak up learning culture. Um, and frankly, if I hear myself talking, I just look at this list here, and maybe I'm biased because I, I but I think that the chart that I pulled together here, um, following this conversation is probably hitting the right points. Um, and I, last word, by the way, from my side is I do see there's still like 30 questions in the Q and A and you've had some excellent questions. Um, I, I, again, this is all about making you think. Um, and so I want to engage, I want to thank the audience. It's really unfortunate that I am not in front of you and can engage with you. Um, but I thank you for doing that in this virtual context. I, I, um, I'm, I'm honored that you are so engaged, uh, and, and, and ask these excellent questions. And I wish you all great self, great success in, uh, in expressing your, um, your, your board role in the best way possible. I'm sure they will. Yeah, I will try to help them in the, in the future. I, I would be adding one of your words, John, which is watch out. Watch out. That is really key for me. Um, thank you, Erf. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, Beatrice, for having uh, and Xiao Ji for having uh, helped us set this, set this up. Uh, we had just some minor technology issues, but thank you, John, for having solved that. Um, we'll be having other seminars, other other webinars in the future for alumni. And uh, I know that Beatrice is also organizing some other webinars, particularly around ethics. You know, ethics, uh, we didn't talk that much. We talked about culture, but ethics is really key. Uh, and also some others around the COVID-19 crisis, uh, what to take out of that for board members in the future, uh, et cetera, et cetera. So I was quite pleased, uh, John, for, to have you with us, with me. That's good. I'm <laughs> I Thank would you. like Thanks to for me, folks. Uh, congratulate our uh, folks, as you say, and board members. And we'll be back to you with some new points expressed by some of you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Take care. Good health. Bye bye.